Good afternoon. I've been asked by the book room to make an announcement which also functions as shameless self-promotion. <laughs> and that is that my book has sold out in the book room. And I do highly recommend it to you. Um, <laughs> particularly if you want to understand how to read Hebrew Bible better and it's written for lay people. My test subject when I was writing the book was my son who was in third year of university and if he could figure it out then I was okay. Um, anyway, the book uh, table says that they will order and you will get the conference rate and you will get free shipping. So that's from them. So my topic today, this afternoon, is kind of guaranteed to make sure that you go home from this conference thinking that, oh, that one was just the bummer. Every time she talked about violence and lament. Sorry, this is more of same. So it's disturbing the peace, preaching when God is the source of violence. So you can't know how much I want not to be dealing with this topic. After hearing the theme of the Lester Randall Preaching Festival and being invited to participate, a theme that I highly support, and then sometime last spring, choosing to consider the violence of God as a topic, I have regretted my choice many times. It's just too darn difficult. But in my line of work, it's also unavoidable. As a professor of Old Testament Hebrew Bible, I have heard more times than I can count. I don't like the God of the Old Testament because he's just so violent and judgmental. I just want to read the New Testament because Jesus is so kind and God is so peaceful and merciful in the New Testament. One student this year cited a quip from Jewish comedian Louis Black that proposed God underwent an anger management course between the two testaments. Often this sentiment is voiced to me by my students on the first day of class and it's often accompanied by the I dare you to teach me something look. And because it is a difficult interpretive question I really can't give them a simple answer. I can only say, you know, the blah, blah, blah of professors everywhere. You'll learn lots of resources over the year for dealing with that question, and they do. In the midst of my regrets for picking this topic, I also remain convinced that it's an important issue for our interpretation and our preaching in the church today in the midst of a world that too often uses religious warrants to justify violence. So, to focus my work, I set out to study passages in the Revised Common Lectionary where God uses violence, figuring that that was a selection of texts most often used by preachers. To limit my study to a manageable size, I based my examination on lections from the Hebrew Bible Old Testament looking for language about violence and God. So I had some conversation partners in preparing this. I've been kind of living with this well for my whole career, but mostly for about uh, almost a year on this topic. I used lots and lots of scripture texts and lots of conversations both with my students and colleagues. As well, I engaged a particular um, uh, book called Violence in Scripture by Jerome Creech. He's a professor of Old Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And in that book, he reviews the issues of violence in scripture and various interpretive questions. I also used a collection of essay by the fa essays by the faculty of Princeton Theological Seminary called Lament, Reclaiming Practices in Pulpit, Pew, and Public Square. I was also privileged to have several uh, conversations with and to receive research from a graduate of Vancouver School of Theology, my school, the Reverend Melanie Calabrigo, who is an Anglican priest who recently won a grant from the Anglican Foundation of Canada to write new liturgical resources that are sensitive to trauma among those participating in worship services. 
I also want to thank my colleague, Dr. Mary Anna Moore, for her work in actually doing a lot of the work with the lectionary for me. Together we determined to review both the, the first readings and the psalm lections, but mostly to focus on the first readings. What follows is not a scientific survey, since we're dealing with hundreds of passages, and I may well have missed some, but I think the results still provide some food for thought. My study focused on how God uses or authorizes violence. Of course, there is no lack of references to aggression and brutality by human beings in scripture, from description of warfare and international political machinations, to the violence of the strong against the weak, and the language of vengeance and retribution in the things like the Psalms. And there are certainly problematic issues associated with human violence. But these references don't raise impossible interpretive questions. I dare say that many of us are not surprised that humans are depicted as choosing violence. However, at least given the persistent questions reflected in my students' bewilderment and opinions about the violent God of the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, it is much more of a conundrum for interpreters and preachers when God is violent. So, some summary observations. In the study of the lection, after we kind of got through looking at all of them, the descriptions of violence that are associated with the divine can be categorized into four types. First, passages in which God directly initiates violence against people, and the corollary to that, passages in which people respond in lament or complaint as direct victims or recipients of God's violence. So that's number one. Number two, passages that imply God intends to use violence or cause suffering. Type number three, passages containing a metaphor or image of God using violence, such as tearing down a vineyard, which is identified as an image for God's people. And then finally, what emerged as the fourth type, passages showing human beings using violence as commanded or authorized by God. Of the 186 Old Testament and Apocrypha chapters represented in the first reading lections in the Revised Common Lectionary, of that 186, 24 lections include language which falls under one of those categories. So that's about 13%. Of the 104 psalms included in the psalms reading, or in some cases the second reading, the alternate reading in the first list, eight psalm lections include language that falls under one of the categories, so that's just about 8%. Note here again that I excluded language in the psalms in which the psalmist asks God to execute violence against their enemies, because that would be human-initiated violence but I included language where the psalmist lamented God's use of violence against themselves. So, while the lectionary does not entirely avoid references to God acting violently, it certainly isn't really a major theme. In any given three-year cycle, one would hear some amount of divine violence if it were a practice to read every lection at every service on Sundays and special days. This would be amplified by the repetitions of certain passages on holy days that are read in all three years of the cycle. But as with any theme or image in the lectionary, it is also entirely possible, even easy, to avoid mention or reference to God's violence through what the preacher actually chooses to preach as the text for their sermon. This would be a version of the familiar preacher's canon within a canon of sermon texts. Given the relatively few references to divine violence, several observations can be made. First, there is a lot of violence in the Hebrew Bible that is not included at all in the lectionary. And given how hard violence is to deal with, it probably isn't surprising that lectionary verses leave out what are perhaps the most dramatic depictions of God's violence or authorization of violence in the Hebrew Bible. A full chronicle would be impossible, but some examples should suffice 
to describe the kinds of passages that are not included. So in the course of his book, Creech, in the book Violence in Scripture, studies in depth some 33 Hebrew Bible passages on both divine and human violence, looking at topics like God as warrior, treatment of the enemies of God, total destruction of enemies under the ban during the conquest, violence in the book of Judges, and pursuing vengeance in which both humans and God use or threaten aggression against adversaries or pray for violence to be done. These 33 passages thus constitute a fair sampling of the passages that depict both human and divine violence. Of the 33 Creech studies, 20 don't appear in the lectionary at all. For example, if one were only using the lectionary, one would never preach on the murder of Abel by Cain or the commands by God to totally annihilate the Canaanites as the people enter the land promised to their ancestors. One would not hear about the texts of terror in Judges, where both enemies and other Israelite clans are killed or passages in which the prophet Elijah kills the messengers of the king of Israel or the young boys who taunt him, nor the numerous threats of destruction voiced by God in the oracles of the prophets against wrongdoers in Israel and Judah, and even more dramatically against the peoples of other nations. Interestingly, from Creech's list of what we might call the top contenders for violence, 13 passages do appear in some form in the lectionary. However, of those 13, all except five leave out from the lections the verses that contain the violence or brutality. This is a characteristic of other lectionary passages as well, leaving out what might be considered problematic language, images, and actions. A number of passages examined in the lectionary avoided even being categorized as violent because the verses have been left out showing in that reading God's violence or violence by humans on command of God. The following examples come from both Creech's list and from the study that I did. A reading about the judge Deborah in Judges 4, yet read in year A, proper 28, fits within the pattern of judge deliverers in the book who are raised up by God to smite Canaanite enemies who plunder God's people newly arrived in the land, the use of God-sanctioned violence. The lection includes the announcement that Deborah will deliver Israel from the enemy king of Hatzor, but does not include the battle scene itself, nor the following scene where a woman of an allied people finishes the victory by killing the enemy commander when he seeks respite in her tent. And here I will do as the lectionary does and leave out the scene of violence. Go read Judges 4 and 5. Another example comes from the beginning of the David story in 1 Samuel 15, year A, Lent 4, where the reading concerns the Lord's rejection of King Saul in favor of David. This is an instance in which a human uses violence at God's command. The scene that justifies why the Lord rejected Saul comes just before the lectionary reading. Because although Saul utterly destroyed the Amalekites as God commanded, he spared their king and kept the spoil of battle, contrary to God's command. The prophet Samuel confronts him and announces that God has rejected Saul because of his faulty obedience to God. Samuel then finishes what was commanded by God by slaying the enemy king, a scene given to us in a brutal description. The lection begins with the next verse, completely avoiding the violence. The story of David bringing the ark into Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6, year B, proper 10, contains the scene in which David dances before the Lord as the people celebrate bringing the holiest symbol of their traditions into David's newly conquered city. But the lection leaves out a chunk in the middle of the story in which one of the ark's attendants reaches out to steady the ark as it is carried and receives an overwhelming 
and bewilderingly violent reaction by God. Verse 7, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him there because he reached out his hand to the ark, and he died there beside the ark. The story of Elijah's contest with the 450 priests of Baal on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, year A, proper 28, is another example of human violence wielded against other human beings on God's behalf. The lection contains the whole story about the failure of the Baal priest's sacrifice and Elijah's successful burnt offering, but leaves out just one verse, the final and violent denouement in verse 40. Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape, then he, they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the Wadi Kishon and killed them there. 450. A final example for this survey comes from Isaiah 63, verses 7 through 9, read in year A on the first Sunday after Christmas, that celebrates the Lord's merciful presence that saved the people from distress caused by the neighboring people Edom. The passage leaves out the verse on either side of the reading, specifically verse 6, where God declares against Edom, I trampled down peoples in my anger, I crushed them in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. And verse 10, where the prophet says about God's people, but they rebelled and grieved my Holy Spirit, Therefore, he became their enemy. He himself fought against them. As my examination of the lectionary shows, it does include some Hebrew Bible passages in which God acts violently against humans and creation. A sampling, then, of divine violence from the lectionary will give us an indication of what a preacher could confront. The lection about the great flood story, Genesis 6, 9 to 22, year A, proper four, shows God directly initiating violence. God announces, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. I am going to destroy them. This statement is made in response to both the narrator and God seeing that the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. The text later makes clear that in the resulting action by God in bringing the flood, quote, he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Why we make that a children's story is completely beyond me. A related type of text that reflects on God's direct use of violence are ones scattered in narrative and particularly poetic passages in which human beings react to the violence done against them by God. One example in the lectionary, read on Holy Saturday in all three years of the cycle, is a passage from Lamentations 3, in which the poet cries, I am one who has seen affliction under the rod of God's wrath. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away and broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. The second category of my list of divine violence where God states an intention to use violence or cause suffering, is illustrated in the lectionary in Amos 8, year C, proper 11. Here, Amos sees visions and hears God's interpretations of those visions, one of which states, the songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, the dead bodies shall be many, cast out in every place. A metaphorical allusion, so type three, a metaphorical allusion to God's violence against people is illustrated in the lectionary reading from Isaiah 5, read in both year A and year C, where we find the extended image of a vineyard which yields useless wild grapes in spite of the gardener's care. The passage clearly identifies that the vineyard is a metaphor for the house of Israel and the people of Judah who do bloodshed instead of justice. God says of the vineyard and thus of God's own people, 
I will break down its wall, I will make it a waste. Finally, we find a reference to human beings carrying out violence as commanded by God, so this is type four, in the lection from Psalm 2, year A on Transfiguration Sunday, which is likely understood best as a psalm marking the coronation of a king. God promises to the king that he will be God's son and goes on to authorize the king's victories over the nations of the earth, saying, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Given the way the lectionary itself, to some extent, helps us avoid the problems of God's violence, I mean, the five that I just found are really the ones that are the, the most evident in the lectionary. So given the way the lectionary can help us avoid God's violence, and given our ability to choose texts as preachers, why not just avoid the whole issue? And we could all just go to the reception right now. We could just say, ah, that's all old stuff. We don't believe that anymore. Let's just not address it. Tempting as this is, my conscience will not let me go there. Maybe I err, understandably, on wanting to defend the Hebrew Bible when my students and others express dislike of the judgmental God contained there. But I think we do damage not to address the issue. Damage to the full comprehension of how our tradition has expressed itself about God's nature and damage to our responsibility as preachers and interpreters in helping our congregations appreciate the depth and complexity of scripture. So the question for the rest of this exploration, when we read texts where God uses or authorizes violence either directly or metaphorically, or texts in which humans respond as the recipients of violence directed against them, or texts in which humans do violence on God's command, what interpretive practices and awareness might help us preach peace? I have no illusions that anything I say will ultimately solve the thorny issues surrounding God's violence, like the questions of theodicy and how we interpret the unjust suffering of the innocent. I do not believe there is an easy answer that satisfies our deepest questions. Perhaps the best we can do is to frame these depictions of violence so that we both understand better the theological impulses behind them and find ways to practice harm reduction in how they are interpreted. What I do, will propose to do here is, is propose four perspectives that might help us approach interpretive questions about God's violence. So, number one. First, a contextual perspective. Here, I propose that we at least need to understand how the language about God's violence would have been heard in its ancient context. The interpretive principle underlying this perspective is one that recognizes that the ancient world was a significantly different context than our world. And what seems outrageous to us about depictions of God might have just been unremarkable in the ancient setting or speaking from the standpoint of the sacred text inspired by the Holy Spirit, this perspective posits that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that shaped scriptures, of course, had to use the idiom and language that would have been comprehensible to the people of that time. Historians have explained the general worldview in the ancient Near East that understood that each state was ultimately governed by a high God who legitimated the ruling house and the religious order of that state. The triumvirate of God, palace, and temple was understood to control the world of that state and to be in competition with other God-state formations. Especially for the largest empires of the ancient world, it was likewise understood that the God of the empire thus both defended the human order guaranteed by the God and would battle against humans who needed to be conquered so that the empire could fulfill its world-dominating purpose. 
the states that were the targets of empires or just when smaller states fought between themselves, each state knew that they had in turn a warrior god who would defend them in battles for control of land, monarchies, and resources. The warrior god passages in the Hebrew Bible emerge from this ancient worldview. An additional contextual reality was that the relationship between the high god and the state or between states where they negotiated with each other were often defined by treaties specifying how the parties would act. The elements were especially found in stipulations about how loyalty and allegiance between the parties of the treaty or covenant would be expressed. In a covenant formulation, a high god could expect absolute fidelity to the covenant and the treaty or covenant would stipulate the consequences for keeping the covenant and for breaking the covenant. Language about blessings and curses was regularly found in ancient covenants to specify the expected divine reactions to either obedience or disobedience and to rhetorically encourage allegiance in the first place. States also used the tactics of making spectacular examples of the application of covenant consequences, in other words, state-sponsored terrorism conquering other states, when handling disloyal treaty partners as a way to communicate how the high god would and could dominate current or potential vassals. Because the Hebrew Bible lived in this world, and use the theological constructions and language of that world, we find these concepts inside many of the Hebrew Bible texts about God, covenant, and state. But we no longer live in a theological worldview that automatically attributes, even without thinking, automatically attributes to a divine being such pointed political and violent attributes and interactions with the human realm. The source of the unease in my student's reaction to a violent God often emerges from an unexamined appropriation of an ancient worldview no longer shared by our contemporaries. Of course, we know plenty about how modern states use religion to justify their power and how they wield power in both legitimate and illegitimate ways. But it grates on the modern ear to hear a God doing that. Interpretively, I propose that it is helpful to at least recognize and help our congregations understand that when we read an ancient text that assumes the role of God as a warrior or a God who uses violence in the defense of God's people or as a punishment against God's people, we are hearing an ancient portrayal of God. Beyond that recognition, I think there are two, at least two theological responses God's people might make today. We might simply have or could develop a theology that posits a very different understanding of God's nature and refuses to allow ancient formulations to unduly shape our theological understanding today. Alternatively, and perhaps in addition, we could say that we acknowledge the import of ancient theological perceptions, but find it more ethically acceptable to adopt conceptions about God that respect the underlying point of the ancient text without adopting the specific ancient attribution of violence. For example, an acknowledgement that the ancient concept of God as a warrior communicated God's fierce loyalty to God's people could become a positive assertion today of God's trustworthiness without necessarily adopting the actual picture of God as warrior. This might allow an assertion of divine violence to be fenced, as it were, to prevent adoption of violence in God's name as a tactic today while preserving a certain amount of respect for the ancient text. A second approach in dealing constructively with the depiction of a violent God might be called a theological approach, 
This is not entirely distinct from the previous contextual perspective, but emphasizes an understanding that ancient texts were making theological claims about God's nature through their narrative and poetic artistry. Where we might express a theological view in a statement of faith or a systematic argument, the ancients told a story or wrote a poem. When portraying God acting with violence, the stories and poetry of the Hebrew Bible portray that God does not act in an arbitrary or self-serving or unprincipled way. This is not a God who whimsically plays fast and loose with human lives. Rather, several aspects of God's nature come through in the theological implications of these stories and poets, poems. Remembering the previous point about the ancient context, God is depicted as using violence in reaction to and li in re to react to and limit human violence and in the measure corresponding to human disruption. Most often, God's principles for taking action are those of justice and righteousness under the terms of God's stated covenant or under the terms of revelations to human beings about who God is. God sides with the victims of human violence to end the power and authority or the lives of humans who do violence to the weak. In the Exodus story, a lectionary reading, God limits Pharaoh's power and the power of Pharaoh's army when they follow the fleeing slaves into the sea, they are overthrown. When God acts as a warrior, in some instances, it is for the sake of the oppressed. Prophetic oracles describe how God will stop the oppression and aggression of the powerful when they act unjustly against the helpless. In such instances, God puts justice for the victims ahead of life for the unjust. What was bad news for the arrogant, powerful, and self-serving people in the prophet's audience was good news for those who were the victims and the oppressed. In one and the same message of judgment against the powerful was a message of hope and consolation for the powerless. They have in God an advocate and defender who will stand on their side against the oppressors. In some particular instances of story, stories depicting God acting in this way, God is actually protecting the good order of creation and the flourishing of that created order against evil acting in the world. Creech writes in Violence in Scripture, what is often understood as God's violence is actually God acting to protect creation itself. The most dramatic example of this is Genesis 6, the lection about the flood story. When God sees that all flesh had corrupted its ways with violence, God responds, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. Interpretively, this theological perspective proposes that it is helpful to understand that when we read stories and poems containing a picture of God's violence, we can be sensitive to the ways the writers and poets portrayed God taking dramatic actions to establish justice in human relationships, to protect a good created order, and to reject and stop the use of violence by human powers. Could we also take this tack, that our faith and ethics could be informed by the ethical values the texts convey in their portrayal of God for justice on behalf of the oppressed, but see the accompanying violence instead as a portrayal of God's absolute sovereignty and steadfastness? As with the previous perspective, I wonder if we could draw a distinction between the ancient assumption of God as violent and the positive values for which divine violence could be wielded.
A third perspective on divine violence that grows out of the preceding ideas is what we might call a rhetorical approach. This line of reasoning looks at texts as the products of ancient scribes who had particular interests in writing the way they did, be that to support adherence to a particular royal theology or to promote religious loyalty to the temple as God's sanctuary. <laughs> me. Those who study the writings of other ancient societies recognize that both of these viewpoints were common reasons for writing texts in the ancient world. And these and other viewpoints can be traced in the rhetoric, the underlying assumptions of biblical texts. This line of approach suggests the, that the portrayal of violence on the part of God could be seen as the use of strong or dramatic language and images by the ancient writers in order to make persuasive points to their audience. The points made by the way God is portrayed may not have been so much that an ancient order audience had to support that God was violent, but they could see what God really cared enough about to be willing to fight for. The dramatic moment, or the perfectly phrased call to witness what God is doing, are conveyed in the rhetoric of the texts, whether that be of human or divine inspiration in the writing of those texts. Let me give an example of a set of texts not in the lectionary, but well enough known in the church to be both interpretively difficult and often cited as reason not to like the Hebrew Bible. These are the stories in both Deuteronomy and Joshua about the conquest of the promised land. One particular story may not be in the lectionary, but it inhabits the background of children's stories and songs about the walls of Jericho falling down. A story that ends, whether it's included in the children's story or not, with this verse. Then they devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. Such infamous texts in which God commands God's people to participate in the destruction of all human beings and creatures deserve the best interpretive practices we can muster. To view such an ancient story in its rhetorical function, notice that the writers included the Jericho story in a story of na a national theological history, which is called the Deutermistic history for those of you who remember you know, your ancient history and Old Testament back when you were in school. Um, a national theological history that was written shortly after the hated Assyrian Empire, which had oppressed Judah for a hundred years, had fallen. So Assyria falls and a national history is written. The writers use their history to promote the theological assertion of national autonomy for Judah under a newly revived Davidic monarchy, a newly centralized temple, and a reconfirmed proclamation of God's power. When the ancient authors told the story in which the people of God conquered all their enemies under God's command and with God's assistance, they asserted that they had taken their rightful place in the League of International States and that their God indeed was God. It displays their total devotion and obedience to God. This rhetorical approach suggests that we can read such stories understanding that the elements of the portrayal are persuasive points made by the ancient writers rather than seeing them as actual history or as direct theological assertions of God's nature. As Creech notes, this lends support to the idea that the total destruction of enemies during the conquest was not a literal description of what Israelites did to Canaanites. Rather, it was a figurative description of what it means to be devoted to God completely. Interpretively, this rhetorical perspective proposes that it is helpful to understand that when we read rhetoric created by ancient writers for their own purposes and interests, we need not automatically join them in those specific interests nor adopt their rhetoric as our own. 
This suggests an interpretive attitude that allows us to find some value in the theological assertions of the story without endorsing, at least in the conquest story, the imperialistic colonial violence the story portrays. We might find solace in the depiction of God's faithfulness to God's people, but view the accompanying portrayal of violent domination over other peoples as an ancient and now illegitimate purpose. We need to be honest about the fact that the three preceding perspectives, attempting to reduce the harm of biblical texts containing God's violence, are only going to get us so far in dealing with this difficult issue. There are only so many distinctions and fences that can be created to distance our interpretation from the text's ancient context, theology, and rhetoric. The texts remain and seemingly remain convincing about the Hebrew Bible's portrayal that God is violent. Another strategy is needed, and this fourth and final one I identify as a textual voices perspective. This fourth perspective arise, arise, relies on an interpretive principle that notices that the Hebrew Bible does not speak with one unitary voice. Rather, there are a variety of expressions and viewpoints contained in scripture. We should not be surprised that a canon that took a thousand years to develop, write, edit, and collect would contain the words and ideas of many people in many different time periods and from a variety of theological interests. Speaking from the standpoint of a sacred text where the Holy Spirit's been involved in writing it, this understanding posits that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that shaped scripture did so across the ages in many different historical contexts and through the lens of different writers. The fact that the Hebrew Bible does not endorse a unified view of God as violent, nor the necessity of God using violence in response to human rebellions, nor the legitimacy of humans adopting God's violence, can be traced in the texts themselves. For example, in the same chapters in Joshua that portray the conquest narratives, there are significant examples of texts which undermine the picture of a violent conquest. The Rahab story in Joshua 2 and the Gibeonite story in Joshua 9 provide examples where God's people make and keep covenants with the very Canaanites the conquest paradigm commanded them to destroy. Other texts throughout Joshua, and especially Judges 1, tell of numerous groups of people already in the land who remain and become part of the new community of God's people. While the texts convey an understanding, an ancient understanding that these included outsiders engage in service roles when they remain in the land, service roles expressed as the drawers of water and hewers of wood, a portrayal that grates on our modern interpretation a little bit, the fact that these people were part of the community is directly named by Deuteronomy. When Moses gathers the community to renew the covenant in Deuteronomy 29, Moses says, you stand assembled today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the leaders of your tribes, your elders, and your officials, all the men of Israel, your children, your women, and the aliens who are in your camp, both those who cut your wood and those who draw your water. He then goes on to make the covenant with all of those people, including the Canaanite once outsiders who are now insiders. This represents a distinctly different articulation from the command by God in Deuteronomy 7 to destroy those people. Another example where the topic of God's violence receives different perspectives in the Hebrew Bible can be seen in intertextual tensions across bodies of literature. For example, we see distinct textual voices in the comparison of the prophet Nahum's 
virulent declaration of God's wrath on Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, with the story of Jonah, who cannot stand the thought that God's mercy would spare the notoriously evil and violent city, but God does. One verse in particular demonstrates the fact that there are contrasting assertions about God's use of violence against the supposed enemies of God's people. When we read in Isaiah about a time when the Egyptians and Assyrians, who are the sort of ultimate enemies, Egyptians and Assyrians, um, will know the Lord. A day will come when the Egyptians and Assyrians know the Lord. And God declares in Isaiah 19, on that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my heritage. Another specific group of texts provide a particular instance of recognizing different voices in Scripture, which help us to interpret God's violence. These are the texts that convey the voice of those who protest God's violence against them in the laments and complaints of the Hebrew Bible. An example is the lectionary passage from Lamentations 3, which gives voice to the prophet's cry, pro poet's cry, I am one who has seen affliction under the wrath of God. This is joined, of course, by the voices of the one chapter we read this morning in Lamentations, as well, one, as well as in Lamentations 2, where daughter Zion protests the weight of violence God has brought against her, a voice in Job, who questions God's justice in the ruination of his life, and voices in the Psalms, where God's actions are the cause of the psalmist's lament. Before we can hear these voices, we need to overcome assumptions that they are considered illegitimate. Too often, expressions of suffering and lament are silenced by social views that sufferers should get over their grief, or by theological understandings that true faith should mitigate any feelings of sorrow or anger or lament and that any expressions of these feelings are unacceptable expressions of doubt. Walter Brueggemann names how important it is to hear such texts theologically. Texts such as the Psalms of Lament, naming the suffering of an individual in the face of violence and chaos brought about by the evil of the world or the actions of God, are in fact a bold act of faith, quote from Brueggemann. Another quote, these texts insist that all such experiences of disorder are the proper subject of discourse with God. Hearing these lament texts when they protest God's violence sets up a contrary perspective to the various words of the prophets who can proclaim that God will punish those who do wrong with violence against their persons and their cities and their land. The voice of protest question the extent to which God indulges in violence disproportionate to the offense or beyond the capacity of the sufferer to understand or respond. Interpretively, this perspective recognizes that different voices in the ancient texts allow us to understand that even in the times of the development of the Hebrew Bible, there, were a variety of, there was a variety of viewpoints about God's use and authorization of violence. Such an understanding can allow us to break the stranglehold of the idea that we cannot escape the Hebrew Bible's commitment to God as a perpetrator of violence. In fact, in fact the texts do not see that as the only possibility. And this suggests that we need not see it today as the only possible interpretation. So, four perspectives that could help us as interpreters and preachers confront and deal with the scriptural texts where God uses or authorizes violence. I readily admit these perspectives may not be enough to engage deeply with the issue of God's violence in the Hebrew Bible. But I offer them as discussion starters because I am convinced that we cannot simply avoid the issue 
I noted above that any attempt to ignore it runs the dangers of not fully comprehending how our tradition has expressed itself about God's nature and of avoiding our responsibility as preachers and interpreters in appreciating the depth and complexity of scripture. In closing this lecture, I want to look at these dangers again because it is here that we come to perhaps, in my view anyway, the most important point, that of the ethics of interpretation. Any refusal to acknowledge and somehow thoughtfully elucidate in our preaching the issues around God's violence could be seen as an ethical lapse on our part. And my original word there was an ethical failure, but I softened it. Beyond our accountability to the fullness of the scriptural witness and our call as preachers and pastors to demonstrate leadership in engaging interpretive issues, there is other damage we might be doing when we decline to preach on texts where God does violence. I think such avoidance can do damage to our role as spokespersons for the sacred texts of our faith in the public square where the image of God who uses violence is a major cultural stumbling block. This is a matter, finally, of mission, and whether we are willing to show that engaging the complexity of our sacred text is a responsible and even joyous practice of our faith, and thus bear witness to the God of that text. As well, Avoidance of the issue of God's violence can do damage to those who have been and continue to be the victims of interpretations that carry on ancient violence in how texts are interpreted. The most egregious of such interpretations may strike us as outrageous. For example, in the lead up to the Iraq war in 2003, U.S. Defense Secretary Ronald Donald Rumsfeld prepared military intelligence briefings for President Bush headlined by quotes from the Bible justifying the U.S. war. But the violence done in the memory of biblical brutality is also insidious and of long standing as we have seen in the history of the settlers' first contacts with indigenous peoples, vindicated by a combination of scriptural justifications for violence and the doctrine of discovery. The need for awareness continues. Those working with trauma-sensitive worship today can help us to understand how the use of particular language and formulations in scripture and liturgy can unwittingly inflict harm on worshipers who are trauma survivors. Finally, avoidance of the portrayal of God as violence in the human Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, can do damage to our understanding of the interconnections between the Testaments. Both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament are misapprehended in such a view. As we have seen, the theology of the Hebrew Bible does not have one unitary view of God. Even beyond the issues around violence, there is a wide range of descriptions of God's nature and interactions. And the New Testament shows a God, even as witnessed in Jesus Christ, God's Son, who is no stranger to the use of violence. One need only remember parables, for example, where Jesus describes God's violence against the vineyard workers or the preaching of John the Baptist against broods of vipers, or most of the apocalyptic texts throughout the Gospels, and particularly in Revelation. When we make the assumption that one testament is the source of divine violence, and the second testament is the version that corrects and supersedes the earlier wrongful one, we do damage to the understanding of a whole scripture. More pointedly, we do damage to our relationship with Judaism, bearing false witness against the sacred text of their religion. At the exact moment when we have just seen the next in a seemingly ongoing litany of terrible violence against Jews, 
We cannot allow unexamined and illegitimate interpretive principle practices and principles to continue. For our interpretation, for our preaching, for our witness in the world, for our ethics, for our relationships with Jewish friends, indigenous peoples, and our neighbors around the world, we must at least try to engage texts that portray God as violent. It is the duty of our preaching and our interpretation. If this talk has aided you in that responsibility, I am glad and I thank you for your attention. Some of you will remember when um, Walter Brueggemann was here and he had us engaging some very violent psalms and our tendency to not want to read them. And he talked about a, a group, and I've never forgotten this, a group he had um, where they would read the violent psalms and, uh, and then he would say to them, now whose psalm is that? And he read the one that there's no resolution in and a, a woman in the group said, that's my psalm, I was raped. And, and, and suddenly it became for her a voice. Um, and so, and Walter Brueggemann's point it was that don't avoid this stuff. And he, he was also concerned that the lectionary was cutting us off from some of these witnesses. And uh, you've reminded us of that and helped us greatly. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you.